All right, so good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today for the third PDIC webinar. Firstly, I would like to ask you all to mute yourselves and turn off your cameras. With so many of us here today, this will help to conserve bandwidth. I also recommend that you use the setting speaker view in order to see the speakers when they're doing their presentations. My name is Sarah Davidson and I'm the Member Services Coordinator here at Cabal in Melbourne. I'm very pleased to introduce Marion Slauson, who will say a few words of welcome and introduction. Marion is Associate Librarian Client Services at Federation University. She's also the Chair of the Professional Development Interest Group, PDIG Committee. Thanks, Marion. Thank you, Sarah. And on behalf of Caval and the PDIG Committee, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia and New Zealand where we live, learn and work. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And welcome everyone to the third webinar in PDIG's webinar series on the new normal. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, webinar etiquette can be found in the slideshow and further information about this session can be found through clicking on the links provided at the top of the chat. If you have any technical questions during the presentation, please type your question into the chat and one of the Caval team will assist you. If you're commenting on social media during or after the webinar, please use the hash, hashtags hash PDIG Forum 2020 and hash the new normal. Depending on where we are in Australia and New Zealand, COVID-19 is continuing to impact our work practices, processes, workflows, relationships and team dynamics to varying degrees. In this session, we will hear about a positive initiative which has been implemented due to the pandemic, but which will most likely continue when staff and students return back to campus. We will also listen to a panel discussion covering things such as how the pandemic has influenced has influenced changes to our services and what the workplace of the future might look like. So in our first presentation, Brendan Cooney will present while his colleague Peter Kennedy is monitoring the chat. If you have any questions that you want answered throughout the presentation, please type them into the chat and Peter will, will respond to you. Alternatively, you can ask a question through the chat after the presentation and Sarah at Cabal will present the questions to Brendan. So to our speakers, Brendan Cooney has worked in the state and Catholic secondary school system for over 25 years as a maths and physics teacher and in a variety of administration roles, including at principal level. For the last 10 years, Brendan has worked at RMIT University as the leader of a team of mathematics, physics, statistics and chemistry teachers, providing a full range of programs for students from certificate and VE education through to higher education. Through workshops, individual support and targeted programs, the STEM team has supported students in gaining mastery of the content of their STEM courses. Peter Kennedy has been a casual member of the STEM team at RMIT University since 2013. He has also taught first year engineering courses in programming and mathematics at Monash College from 2014 to 2019. In August 2019, he was appointed to the BE CSF team with a brief to improve prospects for BE students. Peter studied mathematics and education at La Trobe and Melbourne universities and has a doctorate in mechanical engineering from the Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. So thank you and over to you, Brendan and Peter. Brendan, you might be on mute. Right, as usual, technology or the idiot behind it. In this case, the idiot behind it, I'm not on mute now. Start again. Um, our unit has existed for many years and it's only the last two and a half years we've been in the library. So, um, and that's somewhat unique to have a STEM team in the library, uh, but we have continued to do the same work of supporting students. There's also a writing team similar to the STEM team, but they can, um, we can reflect on that later. As was said earlier, there are five members of the STEM team, and this is a contribution from all five. So if I use the word I, 
remember that I'm, I'm really reflecting on the work of all five of us. Uh, for several years, we've addressed the problem of how, how to communicate mathematics online. Uh, it's quite difficult. There are symbols and terminologies and diagrams, etc., that are very difficult to include if you haven't got a pen, pad and pen sitting next to you. So we have tried a few projects before this, but of course then COVID hit and in mid-March, we had no option but to figure out a better way. So what we did, uh, and I believe many libraries have this facility to ask the library chat line. So we had a system whereby librarians could, uh, or students could contact the ask, the ask the Library chat line, discuss with the librarian their concerns, and a ticket could be established for an academic skills advisor to uh, contact the student and work with them. So that in, a, in the first instance was a bit cumbersome. Uh, the chats or talking with the student would often not be uh, synchronous. We'd have to talk in an asynchronous manner. So you're communicating with the student via chat. You send them an email. A couple of hours later, they send an email back. You reply to that. There was a lot of um, time consuming effort in uh, using the chat system. And also you can't draw in chat. Math symbols can't be used in chat. No direct audio in chat. So we had the situation of having to uh, get the student's question and respond to it. And of course, as teachers and as a tertiary institution, the last thing we want to do is give them the answer. So it was quite cumbersome, time consuming to uh, work through these, these things with the student. So we needed something that give, would give us audio interactivity, the ability to share the screen with the student and work with them synchronously using programs such as Word, PowerPoint, or Lix, if you've heard of it, which is a program particularly powerful in the mathematics area. So we, we had to develop these technologies and over four or five weeks, uh, we discussed how we could do this. We even tried to stick our um, mobile phones on a pole above our pad so that we could communicate with students that way. Didn't work, but it was worth a try. What we're currently using is a Wacom tablet, which you can see on the table there. It's about the size of A5. You can see a pen sitting next to it there. So it, um, uh, it can, it's about the right size to have next to you uh, and write on easily. And I will demonstrate this a little bit later. Um, so what happens now, a student contacts us through chat and we can use, as I said, the PowerPoint, Lix, Word, or OneNote uh, using the tablet, which is most useful. As I said before, the chat process was somewhat cumbersome and didn't work very well. And even though the librarians did a hell of a job, it was difficult for them to, to discuss with the student what their mathematical needs were. So we had to contact the student and work interactively with them. So we tried a few things. Um, for, and this is an example of how we could communicate with a student on, um, on the chat system. And as you can see, it's very wordy, not very mathematical. And you were guessing as to whether uh, the student actually understood what you were getting at. Um, it's not important whether you understand the maths or not. It's really a matter of showing you in the early couple, first couple of weeks of lockdown, the only option we had for communicating with students uh, through chat, very wordy. There's an example of a more mathematical input about the best you could do on chat. And even though it, it does explain the mathematics, it's mostly hieroglyphics, like three times the square root of one minus blah, blah, blah. Very hard for the student to interpret. Very hard for the teacher to map that out and get it accurate. It just doesn't look like maths. But that's the best we could do through the chat process. And then you would get onto problems such as, I'm just bringing it up, um, A lengthy example, and again, it's not the mathematics that matters, it's the content and the length and symbols that are 
evident on that page, even when dealing with simple fractions problems. Now, to use Word to type that out, that um, what Peter did in this case was to write out, the, out this, scan it, and email it to the student. No interactive interactivity in that, but to type that out on Word, for example, using equation, equation editor would probably take me about an hour, an hour and a half. Whereas obviously sitting next to a student would take uh, more like 10 minutes. So that's the sort of problem we faced. And it was very cumbersome again, using, sorry, wrong slide, using the, um, even creating a PDF and scanning it and moving it onto the student. And again, no interactivity. So we started to use uh, the tablet that I was talking about before, using it in Teams, which if you're not aware is effectively another type of Zoom product um, with Microsoft. And we could write out things. Now I stress that's not my handwriting, that's Peter's handwriting. My handwriting wouldn't be anywhere near that neat. Uh, so we, we continued to work with options. The Teams made it a little bit easier but it was still uh, somewhat cumbersome to get the mathematical symbols out there. Then you can have uh, issues such as, just a second one I'll show you, when you've got diagrams, et cetera, taking a minute to come up, sorry. When you've got diagrams um, and illustrations of forces, et cetera, and then the mathematics that goes along with that can be quite, um, or nearly impossible to get out on an equation editor process. So over three or four weeks, as I said, we tried various options uh, and eventually came up with, uh, and I just want to demonstrate this now, that Wacom tablet that you see in front of you now. Now what I'm doing now, I'm actually doing live. Righto, so I'll no doubt make a few mistakes, but I want to show you the effectiveness of using this to um, do mathematics. I can type out a mathematical statement. This is going back to year 10 maths for anyone that remembers it, solving a quadratic. I can lasso it. I can then hit this thing up here called maths. And you'll notice over the right hand side of the page, that equation comes up. I can now click on ink to maths and you'll see it appear on the page there. Um, I can then very quickly, whoops, highlight it, uh, make it a bit bigger because it's hard to read. And move it to wherever I want on the screen. But the powerful nature of, um, of the OneNote process and the, and the um, the OneNote process and the tablet is that I can do far more than that. For example, I can graph it in 2D, um, insert it on the page. And as I said, I've made a mistake there, so I'm just going to do it again. Pull the graph back on the, onto the page, insert it on the page, and I can highlight the graph there move it over, make it longer, stretch it out if I want to, et cetera. And you can see all this is done, this is being done live. So it's quite, uh, quite powerful. I can then even solve it for X, uh, which is, if you remember your year 10 algebra works out to be uh, that solution there. But in fact, the solution, and again, I can move it around the screen. Um, Often, if you remember your year 10 maths, you want to find the, um, you often want to find the y-intercept, or sorry, the x-intercepts, which is putting it to, letting it equal zero and solving for that. And again, you can solve for x, get the two solutions to it and pull that onto the screen. You can even show the steps using the quadratic formula. Again, probably a name from the past. Um, and you can pull that onto onto your screen, and you can go through a discussion 
with the student about that. Like, why are there two answers, right? Why does this plus minus give you two answers? Uh, why is, you know, you're going to talk about one answer, ask the student whether they understand that bit of it, and so on. So a lot of the work of mathematical symbols is actually um, them or, or at least done for you in this context. There's also various other attributes of this. Um, for example, and I'll just show you these quickly, I can ink to shape. So I can, I can draw a circle uh, quite quickly. Sorry, I'll just do that again. I, I can even draw a triangle and it would automatically change it to a right angle triangle. So the, um, the lack of clear handwriting becomes less of an option. I can even do things like write out a sequence of numbers. Again, lasso them, ink them to maths. Haven't got that right, unfortunately, but I can put it in there. And again, Sorry, it's an excuse. It always takes a few seconds, but it's still a lot better than um, than sending emails backwards and forwards until the student understands it. If it's not quite right, you know what? Never works in practice as quickly as it works. So if it's not quite right, I can tidy it up. Worked perfectly this morning, of course, but not now. Righto, so, and I can then ink that to maths. Of course, it's, you'd appreciate this, Peter, it's working brilliantly now, isn't it? <laughs> uh, such is life. Yeah. Look, I'm just going to do that again quickly. I know we're, we're just about out of time, but I'll just do it with a, with a couple of numbers just to illustrate what I'm trying to do there. Five and seven. Lasso it. Um, ink it to maths. And I can do actions such as work out the mean. Uh, work out the standard deviation. And I can again drag these things onto the screen. Now, again, that didn't go quite as smoothly as I would have liked it to, but I think you can see the power of this and it allows us, uh, the other thing it, uh, we're able to do here is share this with the student. So that the student not only sees what we're doing on screen, but after we've cut off the, or after we've finished the interaction, they have a copy of everything we've done. So that's also an extremely beneficial part of this done automatically through OneNote. I notice I'm pretty much out of time there, so perhaps I'll stop there and hand it, hand it back. Peter, have you had many questions? Uh, yes, there have been a couple along the way, and uh, I've tried to deal with them as, uh, as best I could. Okay. Uh, Sarah, watching the clock, I'm pretty much out of time. Um, is there any, anything you need me to do now? <laughs> no, let's just ask. So I've seen uh, Peter's been busy asking questions. Does anyone have any final questions to Brendan and Peter about this? Oh, we got a question here from Joe. Say, I wonder if the maths mentors uh, would use this to help students with maths questions as well. Well, I think it's the most powerful tool we, we have found. Now, it's it's not as good as sitting next to a student because teaching, as we all know, is about watching and interacting with the student. But given the circumstances we're under, it's very, very, very good. So I'm sure it could be used. Um, and it does allow the student the synchronous aspect does allow you to talk with the student and ask them the relevant questions about their own understanding, which of course is, is really important in the context of any teaching, but particularly maths. Yeah, we've got a few comments there saying, you know, um, they know people who are using OneNote, but they don't know if um, students and their teachers actually know this, because that would be a great help for, uh, for people doing their year 10s and their year 12s. Yep. We haven't uh, just, Peter? Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, Sarah, just on that, 
uh, there are two versions of OneNote. Um, ah. So the one that you've just been looking at is OneNote for Windows 10, which has the maths feature. But the other one is OneNote uh, 2016, which doesn't. So okay. that may explain why a lot of people perhaps are not so familiar with the maths uh, solver in it. Uh, the other thing I'd just like to point out is that uh, we've only demonstrated some of the things that the solver can do in OneNote. It does actually have a capability in calculus. And I see a question from um, Simone about she's having two high schoolers. Uh, then I'm sure it would probably deal with a lot of the problems that her kids would uh, have. I can imagine. We just have one final question. Have you had any librarians interested in using it, the Wacom tablet, to be able to sketch or share um, notes with their students, like on topics um, other this, than maths? Yeah, this has um, a significant use within the writing team as well who are not as far advanced as the maths team because they're, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. We had to find something, had to find it quickly. The writing team did have other options available to them. Uh, whether it's useful to librarians or not, I guess that's, we've, we've demonstrated it to the RMIT librarians and uh, I haven't heard of any, any um, take up at the moment, but I haven't asked the question either. <laughs> Yeah, we just have one person here asking how does the student, uh, the student communicate with you? Is that via email or do you Zoom them or? Well, generally we them? would have a Teams meeting with them, which is the equivalent of what we're doing now on Teams, yep. And then you just share your screen and they can yep. comment freely. Yep. Lovely, and thank you. No, go on. No, a really powerful function, as I said, is to be able to share the screen so, or, or at least share the document so that they can ac access it afterwards. Exactly. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Brendan and Peter. It's been a really great presentation. I think an eye opener for a lot of us. I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Marion and she'll introduce the, the panelists for the panel discussion. Thank, Thank you. you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So um, next up, we have a panel discussion facilitated by Fiona Russell. Uh, Fiona is currently the manager of Faculty of Health Library Services at Deakin University Library, leading a team of liaison librarians to deliver services to the faculty. Her diverse professional interests span from health librarianship and research data management through to professional development and communications. Joining Fiona for the panel discussion are Claire Carlson, Hugh Rundle, Kerry Bedford and Monica Shineko. Claire Carlson has been the Deputy University Librarian and Director of Client Services at Deakin University for four years. With more than 70 staff in her portfolio, Claire's responsibilities include the operation of five campus libraries and oversight of the research and liaison services. During her career, Claire has worked in both academic, public and special libraries. Claire is strongly committed to providing an inclusive and quality experience for the university community. Hugh Rundle is the manager of digital Innov innovation at La Trobe University. He co-founded New Cardigan and is currently the treasurer of Vala. Hugh has previously worked at Caval and in the public library sector. Kerry Bedford is the Associate Director of Client Services at ACU. She is responsible for ACU's campus libraries at Ballarat, Brisbane, Canberra, Melbourne, North Sydney and Strathfield, and for library services for staff and students at the Adelaide and Blacktown campuses. She has previously worked in senior client services roles at UNSW and Monash and Curtin Universities. Kerry has also worked at Union College in Upstate New York and UWA Library. Finally, Monica Shineko is Director of Resources and Technology at Monash University. Her career as a librarian spans three decades. Working in academic libraries in WA and the UK for the first 15 years, the second half of her working life has been in the national and state library sector. Before joining, joining Monash in November 2018, Monica was at the National Library of Australia thinking about how to transform the 30-year-old Libraries Australia service into a database service for the 21st century. At Monash, Monica's portfolio encompasses the life cycle of collections from selection to shelf and library technologies that enable users to connect with the collections they need when they need them. So thank you um, to the panel members and over to you Fiona. Thanks Marion. Um, 
Well, I think, you know, we've seen how um, some of the amazing adaptations that people have made during this, um, this period of time. And um, I do feel like I, I say this a lot and it, it's a, a bit of a, um, you know, it really goes without saying at the moment, but it, it has been the strangest and most challenging time in the workplace in all of our lives. Um, and, and yet there has also been an opportunity for growth. So, um, Hugh, I'm going to start with you. Um, to, to begin with, disruption is a term that's often used about emerging industries or innovative practice. Um, how would you describe this, the disruption that we've all been working through over the past six months? And are there any positives that you've noted um, during working from this, um, this period of working from home with changing services? Uh, yes, thank you, Fiona. Um, well, it's funny. I mean, people talk about disruption in, in the media as sort of this, you know, amazing, exciting thing. But I think what we've seen uh, with this disruption is the reality. <laughs> which is that it can be quite traumatic and discombobulating at times. Um, having said that, there have been some good things that have come out of it, I think. Uh, one of the things, actually, I was talking with colleagues about this morning is, uh, and in fact, this is a little bit meta because we're experiencing it, um, the amount of free online professional development opportunities um, has been really interesting. And I don't, I'm actually not sure whether it's increased or whether it's just that we're all more aware of it now. Um, probably a little bit of both. There's definitely been some uh, long-standing conferences that have sort of had to pivot to, to online. Um, and in doing so, a, a lot of them have realized that actually all of their ticket prices were bound up in the fact that they had to, you know, hire a conference hall and they had to cater and all of that. So um, that's had a real, well, certainly at La Trobe, it's, um, it's had a bit of a democratizing effect, I guess, on the professional development opportunities because people don't need to, you know, you don't have to worry about covering, you know, rosters or people being away for three days because they've got to travel interstate or any of that. Um, so right. that's definitely yes. been uh, a, a, a big positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, the uh, Oxford are running a um, three-day conference in September um, so anyone can go to this three-day conference from the Bodleian and it's free. Catering is not quite the same though I find here. True, um, true. Depends on your, uh, on your uh, personal skills I guess. <laughs> um, Monica, what about you? What, what sort of um, positives have you noted? Um, hi everyone, um, and I hope everyone's travelling well. Um, in terms of the positives here, I think um, what um, disruption has has given us, and I'm, I'm, it's this this panel's made me think about the word disruption a little bit, um, and I'm thinking it's more about perhaps not disruption but accelerated transformation because a lot of what we've done at Monash has been about moving forward more quickly in terms of where we wanted to be in terms of our recently uh, launched strategic uh, plan which we launched on I think the 1st of December last year and we had many many plans about what we would do this year and then found ourselves um, being put on hold in a sense but then when we had a moment of pause and reflection in about um, June, July, um, sort of late June, early July, we thought, well, actually, a lot of what we've achieved is what we'd hoped to have achieved by this time. So I think um, the positives of this accelerated transformation have really been about flexibility and agility and our ability to, to respond and be more adaptive um, and more collaborative and just, um, I guess, um, move forward with, with speed and um, trust ourselves in terms of um, being able to make rapid responses in situations. Um, and we found that with all of the changes that we've had to make, when we went back and assessed them, in fact, they were all still aligned with our strategic goals. So that was very interesting for us in terms of, um, uh, is it, so is it disruption or is it accelerated transformation? Because it didn't throw us off course, it just made us go faster. Mm. which is exhausting and I'm not saying it's not, not um, um, as, as Hugh said, discombobulating as well. Um, but um, it was, um, yeah, uh, those are the positives, I think. Um, mm. Yeah. 
Do you think that's that's sort of a, an inbuilt characteristics of of um, many library organisations and and staff that work in libraries the the ability to adapt so um, so quickly? I'm not sure if it's inbuilt because I think um, we. Um, but it's becoming, we're, we're exercising our um, agility and flexibility muscles more now. We have more opportunity to, to really push ourselves and in a good way and in a, in a shared collaborative collegial way as well. I think that's been the, another positive out of this. So I'm not sure it's entirely in, inbuilt, but I think it's there lingering in the background. We're just getting mm. there. <laughs> mm. And is it something that you think, um, I mean, obviously it's, uh, a lot of what has happened over the last few months is not at, happened at a pace that is sustainable forevermore. But um, what what do you think um, will is likely to continue from from that from the adaptability? Well, what I hope will continue, um, and what I think will continue, is that sense of trust in ourselves. So we we'd set, uh, I believe, a good course in terms of our strategic goals and our strategic plan. So I think trusting in ourselves, and in a sense, it felt perhaps as though we were working on instinct for some of that rapid prototyping, but in fact, we were more. Um, um, so yeah, that trust in ourselves, that knowing we've we've set the the right course for this moment in time um, and that I, I also hope that will uh, our ability to uh, adapt and be flexible and agile will also continue as well. Yeah yeah so there are you know talking about um, professional development with with Hugh and a lot more opportunities that, that people have become aware of and, um, and a lot more accessibility in terms of not having to travel and um, certainly I've, I've noticed that um, I don't have to worry about getting the train to Melbourne when on, on days such as this. Um, and um, yeah, a, a lot of um, adaptation um, with, with staff through the, through the period. Um, so a lot of people have been developing skills. Um, Claire, what, what skills have you developed personally and, and your staff over this period that you've noticed? And you're on mute as well. <laughs> uh, I have a mouse that goes to sleep. So unless you wake it back up again, it doesn't work very quickly. Um, so uh, this, the skills that I've per personally developed, um, that's an interesting one because I think generally across the board, I agree with what Monica said about that trusting. But the way I put it is that there's been a growth in confidence about you know the skills that you already have are just so transferable into this I think it's quite a fascinating period of our life that we'll look back on and um, with some positivity I might say uh, about the way that we were able to adapt and make split second decisions um, and also reverse those decisions uh, in just as quickly a, a time where one minute you're scaling up and the next minute you're scaling down. And I think that um, whole ability that um, we have to move really quickly is um, really been fascinating. It's also been, I think uh, our staff were already well and truly into the online environment. We um, mm -hmm. really didn't have that much uh, that we that we needed to change or do differently over that time, which is really reassuring and um, definitely puts us where we want it to be. So it wasn't um, as traumatic. But I think what we've seen is the level of engagement in online. Some of our orientation sessions have had more engagement online than we do when we run 12 um, separate sessions. Uh, but online we're, we're reaching, you know, three or four times the number of people uh, with one or two sessions. And that's been really great. That whole developing of modules to back up what you've been normally doing um, in a classroom environment to a, really a very, very high level. Um, and, and I've always, yeah, so I think the staff have developed and honed their skills more than mm. straight out developed. Yeah. Mm. Um, in terms of the, delivering things online. Um, how do you see moving forward um, what what we're going to retain in terms of say a hybrid model? So I'm, I'm starting to hear a lot about hybrid models in, in various places. Um, how do you see that working? 
Uh, it's fascinating. I'm on the um, transitioning to online group, which involves all of the teaching and learning side of life, as well as down to timetabling, not down to, but timetabling, I've, I've come to understand is just a, such a huge experience to undergo. I would never want to be a timetabler, let me tell you, in this thing. So there is a lot of thought going into how we're going to do and we're even wondering what to call it because um, premium blended or you know whatever it may be at Deakin we already had a cloud campus which when you heard me refer to the five campuses one of those is our cloud um, and I think that um, big distinction between cloud and face-to-face -face is disappearing that whole idea mm -hmm. of really using our campuses in a, in a really interesting and different way um, to really network the students and, and provide a cohort experience where if you've got a lecture on one day in a big room where you don't ever get to speak to anybody and then you've got your, your tuition happening in another ground you don't actually understand that you're a first year student and there's a whole lot of first year students like you moving through um, in all discipline areas so I think um, having that concentrated experience is going to be something into the into the future and that whole idea of your identity and and your cohort. Mm. Thanks, Claire. Um, Kerry, I've got one for you. Um, what's your favourite implementation um, and that you've had to, <laughs> to um, bring in over the over this period of time? Because um, you've, you've got the client services yeah. and sort of buildings aspect similar to, to Claire. Um, and what are you looking forward to maintaining when we return to campuses? I think. Um my personal favourite and it's again that theme of its acceleration it's not something that we hadn't thought about doing but we've um, apart from now where Melbourne is locked down all of our campuses have been open throughout um, the stage three lockdowns and um, at the beginning of the year with our planning we had decided to trial offering extended hours by staff in the libraries between eight and six and then having the libraries open earlier in the morning and later in the evening with security um, walking through the building but not having library staff available. So this is a big change and we started off with a trial at the beginning of the year at Brisbane and Ballarat libraries and um, that lasted all of three weeks before all of this hit. And then we, uh, and worked well for the time that we did trial it. Um, and then we were faced with how do we keep libraries open, um, have some staff available, but also manage our staff's well-being in terms of not asking people to travel in during stage three lockdowns, five days a week and things like that. So we went to opening all of our, having our staff in our libraries from nine to five, having a skeleton staff there, and then implementing this um, approach of having the building open while security were on campus and the people able to use the building and um, the collections, but not having to, uh, not having a library staff available. So a change which initially I thought we we're going to have to do this very gently, we're going to have to do this very carefully because it's a major change. People were really flexible and willing to accept it and give it a go and it helped everybody out in that sort of thing. We were still able to meet the demand for longer than nine to five hours during semester, but we were also able to do something to limit the risk to our staff about coming in to keep those previously extended hours open. So I think that's my personal favorite one because I thought this is gonna be a huge change. Um, I think some of these things as we go on are going to, my perception is they will stick. One of the things that we sort of had on our campuses is we, we put a lot of value at ACU on the face-to-face -face and the relationships with the students. And in the libraries, that meant that we had a very face-to-face um, -face focus on our service. And that's flipped right around during this time. and our use of our students using our chat has gone through the roof. Um, a lot of our online services have just grown exponentially. I think that's probably a trend that will continue. That will be an interesting one to watch as we go through 
mm. um, seeing what life looks like at the end of this. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, there, there's a themes across just about what everyone is saying about um, fast tracking and really knowing that you're actually on the right track with your plans and, yeah. um, you know, that, that must be very satisfying to, to not have to shift too dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were there any particular challenges or learnings? Because you've got the national perspective that um, that the other the other panel members don't have. So, um, is there is there anything you know? You've got different states in different stages of restrictions and measures. yeah, and I and I think it's not just the keeping up with what rules apply in different jurisdictions. That's part of it, but also the impact it has on people in terms of their own well being and how they're travelling. So. Obviously, we need to take much more care of the people in Melbourne and Ballarat than we do the people in Brisbane, for example, who seem to be happily going to beaches mm -hmm. and locking New South Wales people out of the state. So, and they have, sunshine up there the and they have warm weather and things like that. So, part of it, 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 it is different in ju different jurisdictions, and that can be a bit of a challenge. And it also, um, bringing that to mind to everybody involved in the decision makings because sometimes it can be a bit Sydney centric. Mm -hmm. um, if the decision makers like me are in Sydney, then you're going, oh, hang on, that's right. Everything doesn't look like the way I see it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it has been a tricky thing with the different areas. And I think Melbourne and Ballarat are still doing it quite finding things quite difficult and I think that's something that needs to be considered you know as we work with our staff and do the planning. Yeah yeah. yeah. Um, Hugh and Monica what about you is there anything that's been implemented that you're looking forward to maintaining when we sort of start returning back to our spaces or is there anything that you just cannot wait to like, just drop and you never want to see? <laughs> um, I've discovered myself spending you know five or six hours a day in zoom meetings and um i can't wait to never have to do that ever again um it's, like <laughs> it's pretty exhausting and um and also actually i i've been thinking a lot about that in the last week or two because it's actually i don't think you make very good decisions when you've been having video meetings with people all day it does something to your brain so um i think someone in the chat was talking about uh you know when you're working from home and you're working on video it's important to create space for some some sort of down not downtime but you know like disconnected time and i i think that that's absolutely true it's really important to sort of you think in a different way um in terms of maintaining things um sort of on the same theme uh something interesting that's happened at la trove is uh you know in the before times we uh, were a multi-campus uh university like like you know most of most people's institutions and and sort of pre-covid uh we had this bad habit of having uh zoom meetings across campuses which basically consisted of everybody at bundura in a uh in a meeting room having a meeting whilst the person from the other campus, you know, basically watched because they sort of, there's a tendency to forget about people from the smaller regional campuses. And uh, this situation has completely changed that dynamic because everybody is their own, their own little campus, their own little meeting room. So I, I think, I really do think that's actually something that we will carry on into the future. We'll actually be much better at uh, multi-location discussions and and meetings um, yeah that's been my experience yeah. as well too. and um yeah i think that that's a really great thing and often um we 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 do find that the smaller campuses are the ones that tend to to travel more not always but but sometimes um and i think you know now it yeah everyone is in much more of a, a similar situation to each other we can all stay in bed quite late if we want to <laughs> i hope that's true <laughs> yeah. not, too late, not too late. I, th I think that's the same um, at Monash as well. Certainly, um, our experience of collaborating with our colleagues in Malaysia was always much more difficult because of that. We were all in one room and um, um, people from Malaysia would zoom in and we had endless issues with microphones. Well, that that's just disappeared and we have this great mm -hmm. um, 
democratised um, meeting room where everyone occupies the same amount of space on the screen pretty much, which is fantastic. So I do hope, um, like Hugh, I hope we um, continue with that um, in a sense. The other things that I think I'd like to continue are, um, one of the things that we adopted first uh, early on uh, when, when everything sort of hit in late March more seriously, um, our library executives started a, a daily stand-up meeting. We're probably not standing up, we're on Zoom and we're probably sitting down and it's probably not um, strictly agile in that it lasts 30 minutes and it's not a 10 minute meeting, but that's been really useful to keep us together connected on track and aligned and and steer the ship in that sense so that's been really good for us as well um, so that's in terms of some of the way that we've um, uh, some of the uh, particular um, practice that has been very good for us and an agile practice that's been good for us what I hope we can continue and we move to is developing more of that um, agile communication throughout our organisation mm -hmm. as well. So we've started um, meeting more regularly with our library senior leadership group and I hope that continues and we develop a, um, a stronger um, and more agile communication practice with our uh, leaders across the library as well. And in terms of some of the services that I've, I've been very proud that we've um, fired up during this time, but I'm not sure how we might continue them. Uh, we've set up a click and send service despite being open. Um, we've got a, a, and it is what it says it is, you know, you click and we'll send some materials to you. For the users, I think that's a fantastic um, service. It's a huge amount of work um, behind the scenes and we've had to cobble things together quite um, um, in perhaps a less than perfect way. So either we have to fix up the, go back and fix up the pro processes behind the scenes or recast that service in a different way. But I think it's that focus on the user has been really good as, as well. So mm -hmm. um, there's, I have mixed feelings about how we make that a more perfect service um, and a more sustainable service internally mm -hmm. um, and externally. Yeah, sustainability is always the key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually, uh, in, in terms of the, the regular contacts, um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of areas are having sort of more regular, shorter contacts and I've actually had comments from people that they feel more connected to their colleagues who are normally at other campuses now than they would have um, beforehand and I think that connects to what Hugh was saying. Yeah, yeah we've, we've definitely experienced the same thing. We've, um, my, my team and, and our exec had already started doing daily stand-ups before COVID, but um, I think ne nearly every team at La Trobe now is, is having a daily, you know, 10, 15 minute stand up. And it's particularly at the moment, it's, it's really crucial. Otherwise you don't, because, you know, you don't w walk into the office and say hello to everybody in, in your little mm -hmm. pod. So that's really the, the only way to duplicate mm -hmm. that. But, but that's exactly right. We found that it's, we're probably connecting more than we did before in, in a way. And, you know, you sort of can say hello to people's pets and, you know, you, you know what their kids are up to because they pop into the background and, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of interesting um, that we're in some ways more connected than we were before, even though we're further away from each other. And not, notwithstanding the, the earlier comments about feeling as though we're living in Zoom at the moment, and there's been a few times, I think the highest number of Zoom meetings in a day I had was 13, but I did um, speak with a colleague in our central IT area who um, finished the day after 23 Zoom meetings that day. So we can be a bit Zoomed out. So um, it's all about balance, I suppose, as well. Um, I hope there were some 10 minute meetings in that. I hope so too. Mm. <laughs> um, just to go back to, excuse me, Kerry and Claire and sort of just reflecting on the, on the physical um, services again. Um, because physical distancing is likely to be with us for some time. So what are your libraries beginning to plan in terms of managing the services back on campuses? And I'm aware that, Kerry, you've got people yeah. already on campus and, and I know at Deakin we have people in the buildings as well, except for Stage 4. Well, no, Stage 4, we do have some people. So, um, yeah, what's, what's going to happen going forward? So we had um, a group of staff from various levels meet before the beginning of semester two and, and get, the, get the people doing the service to look at the service model and see what changes needed to be made with the university becoming more open in semester two, which at the, 
the stage was the plan. So um, in terms of our service model, we've, we've, we're, we decided to be more strict about our single service point, as in having our staff triage and answer the basic questions and refer on if need be. We have got swipe card access to our libraries so that we have just our staff and students coming in. We have our security staff doing regular walk arounds the library encouraging social distancing. We have cleaning staff coming in um, to wipe down high touch surfaces. We have wipes available. We have hand sanitizers. We have screens in our public areas and screens in our staff areas so to keep everybody socially distant. Um, I'm just looking at the whole long list. Things like being careful, reminding staff about social distancing as well in the work areas. So we have some quite nice um, small staff areas that people really can't get more than one or two people in now. So that also has an impact. People are on campus, but they can't sit around and have a coffee all together mm -hmm. at the same time. So there's all of those sorts of standard precautions that we're doing. Um, we're relying on the swipe cards if we do have to do any contact tracing. So that um, gets us away from the issue of um, having to take down names and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's probably about it. I've probably missed something really obvious that Claire can remind me about. <laughs> Well, um, Kerry, we've done really, and I, I guess most libraries have done those same, you know, yeah. same things. But if I'm looking forward to next year and social distancing still being in place, I'm actually going to see if we can exploit it as an opportunity. Um, libraries have hung their hat on for many years now on the number of people we get through the door and when we break the 10,000 a day barrier, you know, thing, and when we get to our million visitor or our two millionth visitor, you know, it's a hallelujah moment and um, we all rejoice and enjoy that um, thing. And I, I'm starting to get to the stage where I don't want the um, pizza eating, noodle eating people taking up valuable space within our libraries. I think most capital programs into the future at universities are under a severe cap for the, at least the next five years. Uh, so we're not gonna be growing our spaces. And is it really our job to grow the number of students we can take in our library? We, need to, we still need to balance between collection and the number of seats. And so I think it's more the style of seating that I'm gonna be looking really closely at. So in a survey that the Teaching and Learning Committee did um, with the students, one of the, the biggest thing that they said is the students are really, really suffering from not having a quiet space to study. They see the library as, a, a, as an area of academic pursuit. And uh, why don't we go back to that? You know, I, I hate to say, go, you know, go back to the past and, and a more draconian way of working. But I think by the way we arrange our libraries, we don't need to institute the shush rule or the um, chained books sort of idea. Um, I don't mean back that far, but I mean back to where the library actually was a, a quite place for a serious study. Um, because the universities across the board are providing many, many other spaces on campus that don't get get used anywhere near as much as the library um, for casual seating and those more ad hoc meetings that students want to have. Let them have them there. Let's repurpose our library. So that's one of the biggest things. And I think um, that's going to happen gradually. And if we insist on reduced numbers within each floor of our library and limit those numbers, um, uh, you know, we can start to change that whole nexus. The other thing I want to see is, uh, and I've been seeing, is the appreciation of our really high level um, professional skills that we have in libraries. We've had them, uh, but we hide behind a building, a collection and a service desk. Um, so th there, you know, all the things around systematic, the things that we should be doing as librarians, the things that we should be really proud of as doing as librarians, like your systematic reviews and metric reports, um, that deep dive into digital um, literacy and the uh, uh, production of high level modules that can be viewed time and time again. So really, I'm seeing social distancing into the future next year as a bit of an opportunity to break a little bit of that uh, overwhelming trend. I, 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 
I really think perhaps that we really do need, we're saturated, let's unsaturate, you know. I, I think from yeah. our perspective, Claire, we had the whole what if, what if all the students come back and all crowd in and all this sort of stuff. And we found that the students are in fact voting with their feet and they're not turning up. Mm. So our libraries have not been near the new capacity because our capacities are greatly reduced. We haven't had to deal with capacity issues at all. Mm. So, and even students who are coming on campus for practical classes or labs are coming and then going home. Yeah. And, and so it is being treated as the space, the people who need a space to work. Mm. So it's, you, you're right, it's coming in that way by default. It's quality, yeah. not yeah. quantity is my um, favourite phrase at the moment. We're going and for quality, not quantity. And of course, in the digital environment, the, you know, the students are voting with their keyboards and their, um, yeah. you know, we can scale up electronic and digital um, so much more easily than we can scale up buildings. So I think we're just about out of time. So thank you so much for your thoughts and for participating in the panel. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Marion now to wrap everything up. Thanks, Marion. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you to all of our speakers and panellists for your fantastic presentations and contributions in the panel discussion. I can't believe that, um, you know, an hour has you know, gone so quickly. It's been really interesting. So thanks also to everyone who asked questions and attended today. Um, I'd also like to thank the PD committee and Sarah at Caval for organising the event. Feel free to contact the speakers with any further questions you may have after the webinar. You can send an email to uh, members at caval.edu.au and Sarah and Sarah will provide you with their contact details. Uh, as a small token of thanks to the speakers and panellists in this webinar, Pedig and Caval have arranged for native trees to be planted by a community group through the organisation 15 Trees. This year a lot of trees um, will be planted in areas affected by the bushfires earlier in 2020, which is wonderful. So thank you, Caval. Please let us know what you thought of this webinar by filling out the online survey, which will be sent to you shortly. This will assist PDIG in improving future events and webinars um, just for you. So finally, we hope to see you all at another Cabal event in the near future. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>